Thank you very much, sir. I got interested in woodworking about seven or eight years ago, around 2015. And this little image you see on the picture is my first project that I ever did. And it was at the time for my girlfriend, and this is what that I made her. And you can see there's a little quarter on there for size. And I think I took this picture actually and it was done. It's just thin little pieces of wood and I glued them together, clamped them together. I burnt the outside of the, the board to kind of look like a treasure map where to get my inspiration from that. And I just got a wood burning kit and just put images on this piece of wood. And that's, that's how I got started into it. So I started thinking that I need to do something else a little bit more creative. So I started making um, signs. I, I had the idea of making signs. And if I can figure this out, there we go. And this is one of the signs that I made. I figured out how to get from an inkjet printer how to print uh, images and words onto a piece of wood. So I started making these, and this was for a police friend of mine who was a South Charleston cop. Um, this was one of the first ones that I did. And I just, same thing, I transferred the image, I burnt the side, I cleared it, and this is what I came up with. So I wanted to come up with something a little bit better than that and be a little bit more creative, so I came up with wall hangers. I said, I can do something with wall hangers. And I'm sourcing my material, probably like everybody else on the planet, Free wood is pallet wood. So I started getting all kind of different pallet wood and I started building um, these kinds of things. Little cool things you hang on the wall out of pallet wood and, and this is kind of the direction I was going. Even I didn't even know what a handful was at this time. So I started, I started creating this and this is another one. This is pallet wood, this little stick, you know, that was on the side of the branch of the road and I got a branch and I incorporated it into the piece. So I thought even more, I said, well, maybe I can make tables from pallet wood. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to incorporate my sign skills with my wall hanger skills, and I came up with this. So there's the signs back there. I made this little surfboard, and I printed it with the inkjet printer, and this is a little table that I made, and I was trying to sell these. So I, I kept going. I think this is the last one, pallet wood one that I made. It's just a little welcome thing you put out on the porch or something. It's all screwed together, and I just stained it. And, and this, is, this is the direction I was going. Here's that table in the background right there. So I thought to myself, I need to make something better, and how can I do this? How can I make better furniture for myself and learn joinery? I really didn't know what joinery was. So I started going to museums and antique stores, and I started looking and researching furniture and actually putting my hands on it, saying, We've got to, I've got to figure out how to do this. So I, in, my discovery, in, my, in my running around looking at all this furniture, I discovered the mortise and tenon joint, and I knew that that joint is the joint that I had to master because it's in all pieces of furniture just about the mortise and tenon. So I had, to, I had to figure that out and I had to learn that. So there's an example of a mortise tenon. If you guys aren't familiar with it, this is the tenon and this is the mortise and it fits into the slot. This is the cheek and this is the shoulder. This is super important if you're going to make a, a, a decent piece of furniture to understand the joint the way that it fits together. Um, say, for example, you take this bar, this is called the face side. It's the face side that everyone sees. So when you have a face joint, a joint that faces everyone, it's got to be a nice, clean, solid, smooth looking joint. So it took me a long time, but this is the table that I built, uh, all mortise and tenon joints. Everything is, it's, there's no fasteners, metal fasteners on this, and this is one of my objectives to make something like this. So it looks, it appears as though that the joints are clean and tight, but they really aren't. If you get up and look at it, it they, they're really not clean joints. And I'll give you an example of that right here. Um, I was cutting my joints on a table saw, and if you look on this side of the joint where it's blown out, and there's a gap there, this is an example of what was coming off the table saw. I was trying to cut everything on a table saw to get really good clean, clean joints. And the way that I was doing that is I was using if you, uh, I was using this device here. This is a tinning jig. It fits on the table saw, and you'll get your board, and you can see it in here. The board is mounted up there, and you slide this board through, and that table saw cuts, and it comes and it cuts the cheek and the shoulder slightly. Well, it's super important if these don't match up on your mating piece, it looks bad, and plus it's not going to have the joints decently strong. So I had to figure out. What am I going to do about solving this issue? I tried to make everything with a machine, with a table saw, and it just wasn't, it just wasn't working out. I just couldn't get the quality that I was looking for. Plus, it's also the materials that you use. So then enters the realm of handworking tools. I discovered handworking tools, and I started studying and watching videos. I've got many books on it. 
I talked to a lot of people, and I started working with hand tools and discovery how to use these and understanding grains of wood, how to split wood, how to, how to do everything basically from a tree to producing something. And in order to do that, I had to do a lot of work and a lot of practice to do it. This is, this is, uh, uh, this is considered as a Nicol Nicholson bench. Actually, this is a hybrid bench. This bench right here was made by, uh, well, this is from Peter Nicholson's book. And his heyday was around 1820. He published his book in about 1815, I think, 1822, something like that. He published his book. This is slide 12 from his book. And I'll spin this bench around, and you can see the other side of it. The, the, these holes right here, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that, will hold your piece of board so you can plane a port piece of board this way. There's little holes on top and, and, and um, to hold wood down. We'll get that in a minute. And some of these tools right here we have up here, and I've got a few down there I'll show you. He's an he's a English gentleman, and he was a cabinet maker and then later became an architect. This is a slide from Andre Rubeau's book. This is uh, slide number 11. It's a very famous slide if you're into woodworking. And this is actually his shop. Some of these operations we're going to be doing today, I'm not reinventing the wheel by doing this. It's just I'm learning what was done in the past. And you can see these holes in here. You can see some of the operations. He's got right here. This, right here, you see this little hole and it goes into the bench. It's called a hold fast. And Andre Rubeau's limelight in his life was around 1780. That's probably when this image was done. So this is a new technology. It's, it's, I'm using the technology that was already invented. So I, I really like the, the way that, that he has done this. So this, the hold fast. And you see it goes down in the hole and it goes off to the side into this bench. So if I need to hold this piece of wood down and I need to do some work on it, I hit it. Now I've secured this piece. Now we'll move, move slightly and you may have to do some other things to it, but basically that's, that's what that hold fast for. And if you watch it, I'll put it over here so you can see it a little bit better. You watch, you can see this, you can see it flex. You see that flex? Uh, this is a screen kind of, it, it, it does that on purpose. It, it needs to be done like that. There are some ones that are sold that are cast iron. When you hit it, it doesn't flex. And what happens is it, it not only damages the piece, but it messes up your dock hole. So anyway, that's, that's, how you, that's, that's what these are for. These are, these are hand forged. I bought these on purpose from someone who's a blacksmith who makes uh, uh, woodworking parts, woodworking accessories. And he, he, he understands how to make these. That's why I got it from that guy. And it's just basically the same thing as this. The screws here, basically the same thing. The difference is with Andre Rubeau's bench, those are wood screws. These are metal screws. So I have not put metal, uh, wood screws on here. I probably will put wood screws on this bench. The whole objective of this bench is to hold the workpiece. That's all it is. If you can hold the workpiece on this thing in whichever direction, you're good. So basically, you have to hold it. You have to be able to hold it board this way, you got to be able to hold it here, you got to be able to clamp it this way, you got to be able to clamp it down. So that's what this bench is for. So we're going to do a few operations. I'm going to spin this bench around so you, can, so you can see the other side of it and then we'll turn it back. I'll do one operation while I'm on that side. Um, so is there, right now I'm putting this, anybody got anything for me, any questions or anything? I'm putting this stuff away. Okay. Again? Nowadays, if you become a carpenter in the U.S. here, you don't learn those hand tool techniques. In carpentry? Yeah. So the question is, do you learn these kind of tools in carpentry, right? Yeah. It depends. It depends on what kind of carpentry, what, what you do, right? Depends on what kind of carpentry you do. I'm going to say no, because people don't do this kind of work anymore. Really, they, they don't. In order to get, the reason why I do this kind of work is because I want to make good, nice furniture. That's what I want to do. So there, there, are, there are people that do it, but um, OK. You ever use a dado blade? I, I do. I, I have used a dado blade. Yes. I have a, um, I didn't bring it with me. The, the uh, right here, if you look at this slide right here, the previous slide, Is it on here? 
No, it's not on here. So a dado blade, they, they, they have a dado blade so you can actually cut dados with this. If you're not familiar with what a dado is, a dado is a groove that goes across the grain in a piece of wood. A rabbit goes along the end of the wood and a groove goes inside the wood with the grain. So a dado cuts this way. And it's possible to get a dado and cut it by hand. The, the hand tools can cut this. Everything that you see today that you can cut with a machine, you can cut by hand. As well, but you just have to have the right tool for, for that operation. And you, you end up getting a lot of uh, like different hand planes and all kinds of things to so you can do it with. All right, so. So you guys can see this side of the bench. I see. How long did it take you to build the Somebody left a 50. It took about, I would say on and off working, it took about probably about two and a half weeks or so of work to do it. And that's not full time on it. And I did it in stages because I've got, I've got, you know, um, my furniture repairs that I do, uh, antique furniture repairs. So I had to work that in while I was doing the bench. Anybody see that? Space was on the bench. Space was on the bench. All right, thank you. Okay, so this is the, this is the business side of the bench over here. Typically, I, you're never on the side of the bench. In my shop, this sits up against the wall, and I work from this side only. Well, I use this part, and I use this part of the bench. So this is a table that I did, and this is all reclaimed material. This is uh, in the Queen Anne period. Queen Anne period was about 1702 to about 1714. One of the classic styles of this bench is these cavalier legs. That's what they refer to. This bench is mortise and tenon together. Those legs will go, that legs that go up in the top there is put together just like this. The whole, the whole bench is like this. These dowels pull this bench in. It's called draw boring dowel. So if I get a dowel and I put the dowel inside this hole, I'll show you. This is offset from this hole here. I just didn't put this together and drill through. What I did is I put the parts together without any holes. And I push it together as hard as I can to make sure everything lines up. I drill this hole through here. Then I put it back together and I mark that hole with the drill bit that I drilled this through. Then once it's marked, once this is marked, I move that hole closer to the shoulder. What that does is that offsets this hole. And when you drive this pin in through the dowel through here, you can't really see it from where you're at. The, 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 it's offset. So when I put that pin in, it pulls these together. That's called a draw boring dowel. I've got a dowel, and I'm drawing these two pieces of wood together, and that holds it and it clamps it together. On this bench here, we can probably see this one. This is a draw boring dowel on this to hold this leg on. Right? It, it pulls in it. When we put that in, it pulled this thing too really, really, really tight. And then I put the, uh, the wedges in it to spread it out. So I'll pop this dowel in and let me do it this way. Now dowel, let me go a little, okay. You, can you see how it's kind of sideways? It's not going straight in. It's like kinked up that way. It's going in that hole and it's finding the one in the tenon and it's going to come back out, it's going to go down, and it's going to go back up to the other side. And I'm pulling this joint together right now. And hit, you hear the different sound? It's hit, it hit it, now it's going to pull, start pulling it together. And that's all the way through, you can, you can see it. Now what I did is I tapered the side that goes through a lot because it's got to hit that offset hole, it's got to go down, and it's got to come back up, and it's got to pull this joint together. So you really don't need any glue to hold this thing together. This is what, this is, you can just do it like this. If you were going to build a bench like this, it's called a knockdown bench, you can use this technique on a bench. You can pop those dowels out, break the bench down, put it in truck, go where you want, and put it back together. Back then it was a buddy, buggy and cart. But that's how the jaw boring dowel works. And this drawer that you see in here, I'm gonna cut one for you. I brought this drawer with me. There's the drawer. And those that like antique furniture will probably, probably appreciate this. So in, in, in learning about antique furniture, you can kind of sort of date it with the way that the drawer is made. So this is a hand-cut dovetail on this drawer. This is a hand-cut dovetail on this. 
this box that I made, my little toolbox. This is my Tom Bomb Museum box. And this is a machine cut dovetail. Okay? If you notice, say take this example because it's larger and you can probably see it better. There is a mark on this box. There's a line that's on that box. You see that line? There's a little line on that box. Also, if you can see, you can see the little mark that's right there. That's me using a saw going past the line where I was supposed to stop. So that's a mistake on the box. However, on this one, because this is part of the jewelry box that I'm making, you don't see any lines or any of those mistakes on this because I paid real close attention not to put those on this box, right? This box is made exactly like they would make the boxes back in the 1700s, exactly the same way. It's a hand-cut dovetail. You can see my lines on here. Those lines are done, and it's called a marking gauge. This is a style of marking gauge that they would probably use. You get the marking gauge, and you would put it, so I'm gonna mark this for a drawer. I'm gonna score a line, and you're gonna see this little razor line, or score mark. There's a little mark that I put on with this marking gauge. That's where these come from, and I'm gonna show you in a second. That's where the lines come from on, on the hand cut ones. On the machine cut ones, these, these joints are uniform. They look the same. There's really no mistakes because this was done with a router on a jig and I ran the router through it and I put the box together. I have a lot of boxes like this because when I make a box for a customer and I make mistakes, I just put it together and use it for myself. So that's why I have a bunch of these little boxes. But this is, this is a, a, uh, a joint that was cut with a router. Also on the bottom of this, the boxes is it's, it's hewn down. This box, there's a groove that goes in here. So if you get a groove, you pull a drawer out, they say, I see the line, I see the guy cut it over with the saw. So it's kind of sort of old, and I can see it hewn down. I'm going to do this one for you. Handcuff dovetail stopped around about 1870. After 1870, they came up with a joint called the nap joint. After the nap joint, they went to the machine dovetails. This is what it looks like. This is a, an old picture of a drawer, and you can see the line on that picture, right? You can see how it was cut. After this joint, they came up with this joint. So the way the timeline goes with the joints that you're looking at, you have hand-cut dovetails to about 1870. From 1870 to about 1900, you have the nap joint, and after, after 1900, you have a machine-cut dovetail, and machine-cut dovetails look like this. So you can actually look at the drawer, pull it out, and look on the bottom and say, okay, I can see this here. I can see that the, the saw marks are off and that kind of thing. So if I'm going to fit a drawer to, say, a bottom to say something like this, and this is with floats in here. It needs to move because of temperature, so it floats in there. So I'll use my, um, my bench in the backwards. I'm used to being on this side of my bench. So real quick, I'll just do this real fast for you. So tell you, see you have a, uh, a base that you're going to put in here, and the taper, and you can see, when you look at the George, you can see the, the, uh, the hand marks from your hand tools on, on the uh, whatever piece of furniture you're, 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 you're looking at, or drawer. And these things are really nice because you can adjust them real fast. This is a Stanley number six. It's a low angle plane. And this is, this is great for uh, ingrained stuff. Low angle, what does that mean? I'll show you. So I got to turn my bench back around. Well, let me cut, well, I'll cut one thing on the side. So real quick, to answer this question, you can see the angle of this, right? The cutters on these are referred to as irons. So that cutting surface this is a, the bevel is down, so it's referred to as a bevel down tool. The bevel is facing to the floor. On this plane, the bevel faces up. And look at the degrees that you have on this low angle pane, this old, old Stanley. Look how low that is compared to this. So if you take too much of a bite on an ingrain of a piece of wood, you're probably going to break the piece of wood. That's why I got this plane out and I started with the ingrain first. If you noticed, when I started doing this, 
I started, the brain's going this way, right? So I started on this side. So when I start planing it, I'm probably gonna break these fibers out on this side. So what did I do? I turned it so the broken fibers, when I come back and do the long grain, I cut those broken fibers off. So now you have a clean, unbroken piece that, that would fit in your groove just fine. So this is a Stanley number, I think six. Six and a half would be wider than that, but that's the wrong, that's one of my favorite planes right there. And it works, it works beautifully. But, okay. All right. So, I'm gonna do part of a, I'm gonna cut part of a dovetail for you while the bench is in this orientation. And I'm gonna show you where those, these marks come from on that other, on that other slide. So say I want to make a corner for this. I want to put these two boards together and I want it to go like that. That's what I want to do. It doesn't matter if they're the same thickness. It helps if they are the same thickness though. So you don't have to figure out what you, any, uh, any other math or measurements or whatever you're doing. So I'm going to put these together like this, right? And I'm going to mark it with my marker gauge. I'm not going to get it super accurate. I'll just go kind of sort of so you can see it might already be set. So that's close enough. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark this part of the jaw with my marking gauge so I know how deep to cut my joint. You ever use a token saw to cut that I do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use one in a second. I got one. I don't have, I don't have a, a traditional one, uh, an old one I've got, I think of Lowe's Irwin coping saw, but yeah, that, I'm gonna use that in a second. So again, Super coping saws, if you're not familiar with the coping saw, this is what a coping saw is. It's an itty bitty saw, and it's made to cut and make little turns and all kind of stuff in the wood. We're gonna use this uh, to, to, to do this stuff. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, I'm just gonna just take about two seconds to do this. There's a wooden jig that I made for, for dovetails. If you look on, we'll just take this. This jig has got a little corner onto it and it fits on, you can mark your angles. You see how this is an angle right here? That's where you get your angle from. It's from something like that. And your razor blade down there, I'm gonna show you how to do that. But I don't like using this one because my razor goes into it. So I'm gonna go to your side and I'm gonna use this chair, I'm gonna mark this. I'll try to set off on the side so you can see. Let me see if that can work. Is that, can y'all see that better? If I sit like that? So we're just gonna basically kind of sort of eyeball this. And there are parts of the, let's see, we'll go. The parts of the, um, the dovetail, if there's a pin and a tail, I'm sure what that means. And then we'll put this one this way. Let's see, that way. This one will go this way. Okay. So basically, I just eyeball that and mark it. It'll make sense in a second. So I'm gonna take this part out and this part out. Okay. So this is referred to as a back saw. This is an old back saw that I bought at Cherry Street Antique Store right up the road. This is where I got this from. I just bought it in the shop and I sharpened it and I use it. It was like 20 bucks and there was nothing wrong with it. It was just dull. And a lot of my stuff that I get, I got uh, plain from down here, that's from Cherry Street also. So I get my uh, tools a lot. Something I gotta get right here. And could y'all can't see that, can you? <clears throat> Now. All I'm gonna do is follow my line with my saw. I'm gonna show you what that other line goes is for. I went down to my marking gauge line that I marked in my marking gauge. And this isn't gonna be exactly even because I didn't take time doing that.
And this is where the coping saw come, comes in. So I'm going to cut these little pieces out. And I've marked where the, the, the spots that I want to take out. I've got to stand up to do this one. Okay, you see how it's all raggedy and jaggedy looking? This can be cleaned up with a chisel. This is exactly how I cut this, this joints on this box. Exactly the same method. And it looks like that when, you, when, you, when it comes off your saw. I'm not good enough to cut it and cut, and cut the other side and them to fit together. Some people can do it. I don't have that skill set to just be able to put it together after it's been cut. Once this has been cut and it's been cleaned up, you will razor, get, use your razor blade and actually mark this with a razor and transfer those marks to this piece. And this is the side that has to be accurate. This side, the first side, doesn't have to be all that accurate because the accuracy comes with this side. And you put these together and you get cool joints that are, that are like that. So that's basically what your dovetails look like and how they, how they function. Let's get into some planes real quick. All these planes down here, we're gonna use, we're gonna use some of them. I'm going to spin my bench around so I can work. Or maybe not. Okay. All right. Okay. What happens when you get a rough piece of lumber and you don't have a machine to cut it. You don't, you don't have any way to flatten it. You don't have a table saw. We're going to do one, we're going to do an example by hand. There we go. Okay. So I've got a few pieces of wood up here. Now we're going to work with, we're going to cut, cut this, we're going to flatten this by using our hand tools. We're going to flatten this, not all of them, but we'll, I'll show you a couple how to do it. So when you get a piece of lumber and you cut it and you want to make a piece of furniture, that wood has to dry. If you're not familiar with it, it's called wood being green. You cut it, it's moist, it's got all this water in it, and it's going to twist, it's going to move, it's going to do all kind of crazy stuff. Well, you can't have that in a piece of furniture. It's going, to, it's going to warp and move and twist and do all kind of crazy stuff. This is a perfect example. So I cut this piece of wood probably maybe a year ago. And the rule is, is when you air dry a piece of wood for furniture, it takes about one year per inch of thickness of wood to, to, to dry. This isn't one inch thick, but it's just, I may actually want to make a jewelry box out of this. But you can see how messed up and twisted this is, right? Well, we've got to make this flat somehow. We have to, to do some operations to get this thing to a level where we can actually make a piece of furniture with. So we're going to use some hand tools for that. These other pieces also, this for example, this is called a cup when it starts doing this. Can you see it's cup like that? So this side goes like this. This side goes like this. So we're going to use what's called winding sticks if I could find my winding sticks, here they are. So if you look at this like straight edge right there, you can definitely see how bad that is and how bad it locks like this, okay? So seeing how this is a softer piece of wood, I'm gonna flatten this for you real quick. It doesn't take, it doesn't take very long to flatten this. I'm gonna use my hand tools and some of these planes to do that with. Okay. Now, you know how we were cutting that board, that little thin piece of board, and I was going against the grain, I was breaking the grain out, and that little bitty demonstration, that little bitty one? The same thing happens with this. I'm going to use what's referred to as a scrub plane. This board is going like this. I'm going to get this plane, and I'm going to run this plane at an angle across this, this way. When I come across to this side, what's going to happen is all these grains are going to blow out. So if I want a nice, clean, crisp edge, I need to make those so that grain doesn't blow out. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to, I'm going to put this in the red vise, and this is the side that I'm going to plane, so I'm going to do, I have to do it on my side. So I'm going to get a plane, we'll just use the old one too. I'm going to, I'm going to round this down just a little bit. My hammer. On these planes, right? I'll show you this, this is cool. So you have, where's the number, uh, do this will work. Look at this. This is referred to as a lateral adjustment on these planes. This moves your blade this way and this way, right? So when your blade is inside here, you can see it move, right? The back knob back here is called the depth adjustment knob. So when I turn this, this moves the, the blade in and out or the iron in and out this way, right? On these older ones, it does the same thing, but it's more challenging to adjust them. So I have lateral adjustment, I have depth adjustment on this. On this old plane, so if I want to take this, if I want to loosen, loosen this up, instead of depth adjustment knob, this little button is called a striking button, this little piece of wood. I'll, I'll hit the end of this. That just loosened it, it drove that thing, it, it vibrated and it pulled it out this way. So it's a little loose. Now you see it's loose. I want to put this back in. I'll, I'll adjust it while it's on my piece of wood. If I want to put this back in and I want to adjust this, I don't want it to take, uh, take a bite yet. Okay, it's taking a little bit of a bite. Okay, there's my hammer. Okay, so if you notice on all these old planes where it's messed up in the back, that's from someone hitting it with a hammer, hitting it left and right. So the lateral adjustment, the little adjustment moves it back and forth. On a lateral adjustment, you actually tap the blade. If I want to drive this blade down just a tiny, tiny bit, let me take a little stroke with it. So it's not, nothing's really coming out of it. It is almost, I can almost see. I want to drive it down just a little bit. I turn it this way and I can hit the front of this with my mallet and reset my wedge. That should have drove the blade down just a little bit. Now see how it's taking a bite? So I just drove that blade. I didn't even touch it. I just hit the front of it and that shocked it and it pulled it forward. So now I can take that angle off that I was talking about. So that's basically how to adjust these old ones. It's, it takes a little bit of finesse, and you don't have to hit them very hard. So now with the, the scrub plane, we're going to start flattening this piece of board. We're going to refer to as winding sticks. They're just flat, true pieces of wood. That's all it is. It's two pieces of stick that are true and together and flat. So what I can do with these winding sticks is I can check my workpiece before you even start my workpiece. So I can, without any, any other fancy tools, so I can get down here and I can look and I can see the way the board is twisted, what's, what's high, what's low, wh whatever I want. And I'm just looking straight over the top of this. And it's obvious on this one that, it, that the top is curved. So we're going to take this part off. This is referred to as a scrub plane. Scrub planes are made to take big giant dice of wood off in this, for this example that we're doing. This, this blade on this, or iron, it looks like this. Here's the iron, and it's curved like that. And this is the cutting surface. So if you look at it, I don't know if you can see that. See how it's curved? <laughs> so that is on purpose so you can take big bites of wood, big chunks of wood off of it quickly without having to finesse it with you know, one of these other planes. So we're going to flatten this super quick. So if this, if the reason why this is up this way, if I had it this other way, and I started with the like this, it's going to rock. So I want to flatten the other side first. It's stable because it's on, it's got those two ridges that are messed up. So I'm going to flatten this and I'm going to get my, my scrub plane. I don't know how what the depth is. I just got to see. Okay. So I'm just taking tiny little chunks off right in the middle. And you see it's just not really taking a bite. So I want to adjust this a little bit deeper. This is a super old plane. So it's still kind of a manual adjust thing. I'll loosen it up and I'll just tap the blade the iron just a little bit to, to sink it. That's my lateral adjustment because I can see it's off. You see how far I went. Let's go farther. So I'm, take, I'm trying to take more of a bite and I can see my blade is sideways. So I'm going to do my lateral, do my depth, tighten it again, see what I get. That's a little bit better. Still need to take more because it'll take me all day this way. So we'll go a little bit, a little bit more. 
I do depth. I saw it move. I'm going to go back and tighten it. I'll show you what this is going to look like. This is some super soft wood. You see the kind of how it curls like this, where the blade's going through it, and how it's ripping out right here? Well, there is grain in wood that also is in here. So this grain, it looks like to me, because this is ripping out so bad, so some of the fibers in the grain are running like this. So when I put this blade, when I put this and I push it this way, it gets those fibers and it pulls it up and rips them. So we're going to try turning the board around and see if we can get a different effect, a different, uh, really, uh, a different result with our plane. And we'll clean, we'll clean up with a smooth, a smoothing plane. So let's see what happens this time. That's not much better, so we'll just keep going. And we're going to take this hump off. Let's see, there's this chunk that's coming out over here. And you can kind of feel when you do it how, how the plane is setting up and it kind of wants to rock on you. Now just with that little bit of work, you can see how much more it's taken out, right? And the reason why I'm going at an angle and not straight, I'm, I can reference the plane off this entire surface. If I go this way, I'm going to, I'm going to want to go one side or the other side of, of being out of square. So if I move across, I can reference across the whole, well, all of the board. That's what we got so far. So you notice I turned the board, board around, and we're not up to this edge yet, but I didn't take, I took this off, but I didn't take this side off. So when I get to this side, it's gonna blow out, I'll show you. I'll leave it like that, I won't fix it. And we'll blow that other side out so you can see. There's a little bit of round to it from the manufacturer. There it goes. Okay. That's good enough. We're going to do this all day. So here's one part. You see how it kind of is starting to flake and starting to come off right here? And the fact when you buy boards, a little bit rounded. So I'm getting just below that round and starting to blow that side out. So now we're going to use the other plane. I don't know what I did with it. There it is. Does anybody know why one plane is longer than the other plane? The reason why you have one plane longer than the other plane, it's reference surface. So if you look at these two planes, how long this one is compared to this one, right? The reason why that is like that is this references off a smaller space, this references off a larger space. So if I were going to use this to get rid of these big undulations in this wood, I'm referencing off a huge area, and I can't get down to the smaller little nitty gritty of it. it. This plane will follow the undulations more so than this one will. So we're going to use this one. It's considered as a smoothing plane. And this is a newer one. This is probably about 40s or 30s. And when, when I'm stopping, I'm, I'm getting my depth adjustment, and I'm moving it just a little bit. Move a little bit more so I can take a little bit of, of a more bite of a bite. I'm slowly going to sneak up on it. There we go. I'm looking in my plane. My, my chips are coming off the left side of my plane. The ladder, that's what the ladder adjustment's for. If the chips are coming off this side, that means this blade is sticking out farther than this side. I don't want that. So I'm going to move the lateral adjustment to the, to the side that it's coming out of that shifts that blade, now my chips will, should start coming out more in the middle. You see, it's not taking a big of a bite because it's more, it's evenly spaced. You can hear the kind of skip. It's starting to get down lower. Now let's start taking off some decent shavings. There we go. Okay, now, that's way better. Okay, we'll stop with that. So this side is flat, basically, like almost flat. It still has a little undulations in it, and this side's still 
got that big, big, that big curve in it. So if I want to go take this down a little bit further, I move to a larger plane. More reference. We took the thing out, I got to back it out. There's a more reference surface, so we got to be really careful. I'm looking at the chips come out. You see the chips come out on the left side? So I move my lateral adjustment so I can start shaking, taking chips out more so in the middle of it. There we go. And this will get it a little bit smoother and a little bit more flat. I'm, I'm doing my depth adjustment. I'm dropping the, the iron down into the wood more. You hear that skip skip? It's hitting the low areas and coming back to the high areas and it's taking those off. There we go. Now it's starting to look pretty good. So a couple more in here. Okay. So this side is flat. This side isn't flat. Now if you notice on here, you see this line right here? That's coming from the plane. You have to set your planes up. This one hadn't been set up. The edges of your, of your iron, yeah, this one is set up. I'll show you how this one this one's set up. The edges of your iron, right here, this is curved a tiny bit. So when I draw this thing through here, it doesn't leave those strong, definitive marks in your workpiece because it's flared just a tiny bit on the side and it won't dig in. So that, that, that's how this is, uh, this iron set up. So anyway, you get the idea of finding what will be the other side and we can dimension it. That's, that's what we can do with this. So once we get a dimension piece of wood, we, gotta, we have to be able to cut it and make something out of it. So we're gonna cut a tenon. We're gonna cut one of these on, we won't do the mortise because we don't have time to do the mortise, but we'll cut a tenon. I'll show you to do that by hand. It's pretty, actually pretty fast to do it. When you want to, like you see that table right there? See how the boards are like this? Right, they're running long ways and they're going to put them together like this, okay? So when we do, when we do a tenon, I'll show you, why, show you what's super important about that. When you get a board and you put them together like that table, this is, this is called joining. You joint this board to this board together. In order to make that seem like perfect and seamless by hand, there's a trick to, there's a method that you can do, a methodology that you use for that. It's super, super easy. But I, that goes in conjunction with the, with the tinning cutting. I'll clean up my little mess here, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a demonstration of that. We'll use one of the older planes to do that, to joint two boards together. And it's my board right here. Yeah, it's too hard. Look here. We'll use these. So watch this. So this is my tabletop. Right? And it goes together and I have different boards and it's long and this is my table and this is where I sit and eat dinner. So I'm getting my tabletop, the part you put your plates on and I'm gonna put them together. So now I'm looking at the underneath side of the boards and the, the table that you, the part that you eat on is squished together right now. So, I'm gonna show you how this works. So I'm gonna use a joiner plane. The longer planes are referred to as joiner planes because it's got a super duper long reference, reference face. So if I were to get a table like that, I would put it in my vise and I'd run the board out this way and I would use this joiner plane and I would joint both the boards at the same time. The reason why I'm gonna do that is if I mess up and I flex my plane one way or the other, it flexes, it makes messed up on both sides. So it doesn't matter if one side is cut at an angle, the other side's cut at the same angle. So when you open it up and put them together, the angles, they offset each other and they match. So you can screw it up, but they still go together, which is fine. And this is a very you know, short piece. And I don't know if this is set up. Okay, it's set up. So I'm gonna take real light, 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 light shavings with this plane. And you can hear it go skip across the surface. It's going to get flat. Now I've got a continuous, I've got a continuous stroke on it. I'm holding the plane like this, and I'm, my, my finger's referencing to this. You get used to it where you can almost make it perfectly square off the plane by just doing this by referencing. 
with your finger and I'm guiding it. It works really great with the smaller ones too. If I'm doing a larger piece of wood and I need more surface, my grip will be this way on the older ones. And I would run it, run it through this way. So I gotta have it square. So I'm feeling it, I'm pushing down, kind of squishing it, and I'm pushing on the front and making it flat and get a, and getting a run at it. Now if I did that enough, when I open it, they should be perfectly matched together if I can get the line. So there's not going to be, so I can actually, this will be a tabletop now. I can make this a tabletop. And when I, when I joint boards and I'm making tables, I always leave a little bit long on either side because sometimes when I go in, I don't know what I'm doing, I will have the, the plane one way or the other and I'll take a little bit too much off one side or the other when it's coming, going in or coming out. So I always leave a little extra for me screwing up, which happens quite a bit. So this is, these, are, these long planes are really good jointed planes. We're going to cut this joint right here. We've got to get this dowel out. Our drawboard dowel, we have to pop it out of this hole. And we will get it out with my little, oh, it's in this one. So this is the advantage of draw boring. So I'm gonna pop it out. It's kind of hard to get out, and as soon as you get past the middle, it changes. If you hear the even change the sound, now it's, it's a little bit easier to top. It'll we'll fall out, there it is. Okay. We don't have time to cut the mortise, we only have time to cut the, uh, the tenon. So we might as well just flip the board over, and we're gonna cut a tenon on the side. The way that you cut tenons, you always go off what size of chisel that you have and what size of mortise that you want. So if my chisel is this size, I'm gonna cut my tenon this size. The reason why is because this has to go into something. This hole is the same as this chisel. So I made it that big on purpose because that's the tool I have to get the stuff out on the other side. So it, you, it's not a lot of math to do. It's like, okay, it's that big, it's that big, that's how big it is. So you can use a smaller one or a bigger one. We're gonna use a little bit more of a modern gauge. Should already be set up. There's two little wheel cutters on this gauge, and I set them so it's just as wide as my, my chisel. So when I cut this joint, when I do this, yeah, we'll do this side. When I do this, I'm gonna, even before I start, I'm gonna label the side. I go A, B, C, D, but you can label however you want. So I'm gonna label this side A, and there's a reason for that, because when this goes into its mating surface, you need to reference your tool off the same side. If you don't reference your tool off the same side, your, tip, your, your joint's gonna be off. So I'll show you what I mean. So this, let's do it this way. It's easier if I do it this way because I'll, I'll have an example right here. So this is, is set up to the thickness of that, right? So I need to get this thickness and I need to put lines on this piece of wood so I know I, I know how, how, how big it is, so I'm gonna label this A, I'm gonna get my tool, and I'm gonna reference from my A side. It doesn't matter if this is exactly, exactly, perfectly in the middle, the way that you find that out is you'll reference from one side, and I'll, I'll put my two lines with my marking gauge, and if I turn my board around and go reference from the other side, and I put two more lines, if they're not exactly lined up, then it's not in the middle. You don't need to do math or divide or anything. You just put a mark, turn around, put a mark, no it's not. So you just move your gauge until it does match, and then that's it, you don't need to measure anything. I honestly, I very rarely measure. The only time I really measure something is if I need a height of something and a length of something. And then once that's done, everything else is just joints. I know I, I just mark the joints and I just pull the piece of wood up and I just mark it. So that, I don't even know how long it is, who cares? Just as long as it fits in, you know, whatever space it needs to fit in, that's what you need. So I'm gonna mark the top of this, I'm gonna reference from my A side, and I'm gonna put a line right across the top of this thing. I'm gonna put a line on the other side. So now I have two lines on the top of this, on the top of this piece of wood, right? So basically that's, that's what that is. Now I need to know how far to go down with this. I'm just gonna go off the other one, I'm just gonna mark it. So I need to go down, say that far, I, I wanna go down. So I'm going to, where's my, so I'm gonna use my little bitty square, and I'm gonna use my razor blade. 
This is how you get super, super pre precise stuff. So you don't, you don't guess, you know exactly, exactly where it is. The reason why you can't use a pencil to mark your joints is because the, it's this wide. That's a pencil line. That's way too big. You don't know what side of the pencil line to cut on. Do you cut in the middle? Do you cut on the left? Do you cut on the right of it? No, on the razor, you know you cut in the razor line. That's it. You can't mess that up, or you can mess it up, but you know exactly where your mark is. So with my little square, I'm gonna put a little, I'm gonna put a little nick on the side of my board, and what I'm doing is I'm marking this right here. And if you notice, a razor blade isn't a razor blade razor is it is it is it flat? It goes like this. Here's a, here's one. Here's the blade, right? And it comes down. And that little pointing part is the razor, right? So even to get more accurate, if I were to make a slice in this piece of wood with this razor just go straight, like this, that 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 razor line is like that. So what side of the razor line do I cut on? Do I cut on the left side, the right side? Do I cut in the middle? So you have to be that exact precise to cut really good joints. So when I use a razor blade, I don't like using a marking gauge, and this is what a marking gauge looks like. You so saw it's flat on one side, and it's beveled on the other side. When I mark my joints, I put the bevel side to my waist. The flat side is the show side, the side that people will see. So you're cutting the waist angle part off your workpiece. So what I do when I use a razor is I turn it like that, and the straight part is my show side. And that's, that's how I rectify this problem. Because I think these are too big and they're too bulky. I just don't like them. So I'm going to mark this. And I put my little nick and I'm going to, see I took my, my blade is kind of sideways a little bit. I'm going to razor, I need longer. I'm going to razor across the grain. Pine is kind of hard to work with because you have to have super duper sharp tools because it's so soft. And instead of cutting the grain, it'll tear the grain and it looks horrible. So I'm going to, I'm going to go really super light pass and I'm going to mark that part right there. This is pine. Why is it yellow? I don't know. Why? Does it look like white? Yeah. yeah I don't know what I'd actually bounced on. I mean, it does, but I don't know. That's a good question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer this mark to the other side. So I'm just going to stand it up. And I'm going to transfer my mark. Put it in a razor line. And all I'm going to do is put a nick on the other side. So now, if, you, if some of you guys do woodworking, I'm sure, you know how you transfer a line, you draw a line, you draw it, you draw it. Sometimes you get the other side, it's like a tiny bit off than the other side. It can't be a tiny bit off, it has to be perfect. So sometimes you end up, it ends up being you know, good, sometimes it doesn't. Just can't. Hopefully this will work, this board should be pretty square. I'm going to do one more line, a little mark. Now, I need to cut this off. I need to cut this part out of this piece of wood. So I'm going to go back to my marking gauge, and I'm going to mark down the side, because the reason why I did that, I know where to stop my marking gauge when I start marking. And I'm going to reference from my A side. I'll put it in here. You don't have to put it in here. You can do it. So I'm going to put this. I'm going to mark. I'm just going down to my gauge line. It's important that you get these deep. And I'm going to show you why. Because we're not going to cut these cheeks off with a saw. We're going to split them off. So we're going to do a super, super, super old school. So I want these marking gauge lines really, really deep. I'm going to go to the other side. Still referencing off this, though. Still referencing off my same side, right? I'm going to put them deep. I'm just going down about where that gauge line is. I'm not going to be super accurate. I'm just going to show you can see. I'm going to go to the other side. Now we're going to cut this. I forgot to transfer my marks to... So what did I do? I don't have a, I'm going to cut these, I'm going to cut these, but I don't have, I don't have anything to, to reference. I don't have a line to follow for my saw because I'm going to, I'm going to show you. I'll carry that line just a little bit so I can see it with the other side. 
this is the way you got to do it. If you're doing it by hand, this is, what you, this is the process you go through. But once you do one, say you have 50 of these to cut. Once you cut one, you, you, you've got a process and you're all in the dimension. You mark them all, you cut them all. So it becomes easy. All right, now you get an idea. So now we're going to take this off. We're going to take this out. Right? You kind of see how that works? Right? We're going to take, remove this part so we can get to the cheek. The way to make this super accurate is I'm going to use a chisel and I'm going to, this will work, I'm going to make a little V right where I put that razor line. I'm taking a little piece of that out, right? So now my joint is razored in there. So it knows what it is, and it's clean, it's a clean line. It's not all jaggedy and raggedy looking. It's a nice, clean, straight line. And inside that little line is a little bitty kind of sort of a V. So what I what you do once that, let me do the other side while I'm not doing this exercise here. I'll, I'll trim this one. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of cut that razor line deep is so I can take this off. And this is, this is what I was trying to do with trying to get my, when I got into the hand tools, I was trying to do this on a table saw. There's no way you can do this accurate, not unless it's a CNC computerized kind of thing, you know, something like that. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this tool, the saw, and I'm going to set it inside that groove, right? So now it has something to rest in. The tool has a guide to go in somewhere. I'm going to try not to go this way. If I do anything, I want to go this way. I'm exaggerating right now, but this way just a tiny bit. Because when this goes in, when this, when this goes together, it's okay. This is actually a little bit. If it, if it, if it goes in, it'll still be, the joint will be tight. But if it's flared the other way, there's a big old gap. And you don't want a big old gap. I'm not saying just, you know, want a big gap for whatever reason. Okay, so watch how I do this. Let me sit down. So I'm going to get this saw, uh, my Cherry Street Antique saw, and I'm going to follow this line. It's hard to see in the dark, but I'm going to follow this line. If you notice, my saw is at an angle, okay? That's one reason why this is angled over here. So when you angle your saw, when I cut that joint, I wouldn't hit my bench. That's why it's like, that's why, that's why I made it that way. Or that's why they made it that way. So I'm going to get this, I'm going to, this is a pull saw. That means it, if it's a push saw, it cuts on the push stroke. It doesn't cut on the pull stroke, it cuts on the push stroke. This is referred to as a Japanese pull saw. This cuts on the pull stroke. It's a difference. I started learning on this, and every time I want to use something like this, I thought it was cutting, because I'm used to cutting one way, then all of a sudden I had to change my brain to, to, to it cutting out. So the, the, teeth on this, the teeth on this are faced that way, so when I push this saw, it's going to cut. So I'll, I'll get my thumb. And I'm going to drop that right in that groove, and I'm going to guide this saw. And I'm looking at my razor line on this side, the marking gauge line, and the marking gauge line on my side, but you know how far to go. And I'm going to barely, barely let the saw do the way. Just barely come down just a tiny bit. I'm just very resting it on there. And I'm going to push it, and it's going to take a, it's going to take a, uh, it's going to take a bite out of the wood. Now, I'm watching this side right here. I'm going to cut like at an angle. You rest, my, rest the angle of my saw. I'm following that line, and I'm slowly dropping the front of my saw, and I'm watching my razor line right there, right? Now, I've noticed that my saw is this way, so I'm going to push it that way a little bit, and I'm still, I'm not down the depth here. I'm going to slowly go across my marking gauge line at the top of the razor, and I'm in that trough we've made with the chisel, right? And I'm going to slowly bring that to the other side. I'm gonna, now, I've got, a, I've got a groove that goes all the way across. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to cut to my, to my line on this side, now inside that we have like a little V, we have to take the metal part out, but we're almost there. So I'm going to go get it back in there, and I watch, I'm going to drop the front of my saw, and I'm going to look on the other side, and I can see that razor mark, and I can see that line right there, and I'm going to go to that line, and then now we have the middle part to take out. So what I'm doing is I'm letting the, now I'm going to cut it, and I'm super accurate, I'm letting what I just cut guide the saw for what I'm fixing the cut, right? So now I can let this all do, do the work. And I'm kind of rocking it back and forth nice and easy. Almost there. There we go. 
and I'll do the other side real quick. So you get the idea. And we're not talking as much, it goes a lot faster. So I'm going to go make my mark, go drop my hand. I'm going to let what I just cut guide it into the screw that I just made. I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to take it out. Okay. So this is a super old technique right here. This is how 16, 1400, 1400, 16, 18, 1700 furniture was made. You can get your saw and you can cut down that line, right? You can do it that way. But there's a faster way, but it's a little bit more dangerous, especially if you're working with something that you've been jacking with forever and you don't want to mess your workpiece up. So if you mess it up, you have to fix it or make another one. Let's see if you can you see it. That's, you can probably see it better that way. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm looking down this piece of wood and I'm looking at the grain. I'm reading the grain, I'm saying, okay, what's the grain going to do when I split this off? So I get my chisel, we'll go with the bigger one. I'm going to get my chisel and I'm going to look right down, right down the, the wood, and I'm going to come get my chisel, the bevel is facing towards you, flat side is toward me, and I'm going to take off just a little bit, because I don't really know which way this grain is going to go with, right? right? So I'm cutting in the grain, you see how I did that first cut? How the bottom of the grain is starting to go to you, but I started up so that there's an angle like this now. That's safe for me because I know it's not going to split into my joint. It's going to split away from my joint. So I'm going to be confident that I can do the same thing on this side, but you don't know, wood, wood changes all the time. So it's still splitting away from you. I'll still cut that off to my line. I've got to be careful not to go too far. See how that one came off? That was perfect. I'm going to bring the chisel a little bit more closer to me because I still don't know what it's going to do. See how it falls off when I get to my cut mark? That's referred to as a stop cut. Because it, it's only, it only can split until, you know, as far as I cut. Now I'll show you what I have. So I have that. See how much kind of jack it is? I got that much. So. I'm going to go a little bit further. I'm going to be a little bit more bold. And I'm not going to my, into my, uh, my marking gauge line yet. I'm going to stay away from it just to see what this last part's going to do. I don't know what it's going to do on this side. So it looks like it's pretty much cutting straight. I'm, going to, I'm not still not in my razor line. Still a little bit away from it. See what this one does. Okay, now I'm going to drop actually into the, from the marking gauge we made. I'm going to go right into the line. With, I'm putting my chisel in that, in that razor spot. Not a pencil line, exactly where I want it to go. Not a little this way or that way, it's like perfectly in, in that spot. I could have marked it wrong. Now on the side, I followed that line with my chisel. I saw it and I saw, okay, it's perfect. It's, that's why I had to be deep. So it kind of splits it like that, right? And let's see what this one does. This one worked last time, it just taped up there, guys. All right. I'm going to look straight down my chisel, and I'm going to pare this down a little bit. This side's kind of goofy. All right, that's good enough for right now. We're going to clean that up. So I'm going to do this other side. If this side splits, sometimes they split really, really, really nicely. Sometimes they don't. I'm going to go halfway and just see what happens. a little bit closer to me, kind of pull it off to see which, which way the drain is going. And then I'll go right into my line. I'm watching my, my, my line on the side, try to split it right on that line. I'll pair it. Okay, there's one more operation we can do. Uh, that's, that's basically a super rough cut tenon, right? This will fit into, uh, this right here, it'll fit into a mortise. Basically left like this. But we can clean it up a little bit more. We're going to take the operation just one more step, and we're going to use a, what's, what's called a, um, a rattle plane. And I will show you how the rattle plane works. This is a super awesome tool. Someone was asking about dados before. 
If you cut a dado into a board, remember the dado goes across the grain. This is the tool that you need to clean up the dado to make it perfect. And I use this tool on this bench. And you see this piece of board right here? OK, it goes all the way through. But on the other side, there's a dado behind this. There's a slot that that board fits into. It fits into a groove. This is not stuck in there. This board comes all the way up to the bottom of the bench, and it's in a dado. And I cleaned that dado out with this tool. I got it kind of sort of close to where I wanted it, but to dial it in perfect, we use this tool here. This is a router plane. It's called Stanley Number 71 router plane, and this is a super awesome tool. So I'm going to show you how we're going to use this. It's for data. That's what it's for. But it's for this, uh, these other operations, too. So my whole class, I will get my piece of wood. If you want to protect this, you can put something underneath that. And I have a mallet for this one. The reason why I have two, two different mallets is this is my, basically my joiner's mallet. And I don't want to break this. I want this to last as long as possible. But this one I made two rippies with. So when this splits off and breaks, I just will cut this off, reshape this, and make a new head and put it back on. That way this one will last way, way long. This down and this, this one is jaw boring. It's pulling that head down to this. This head is removable. It's not glued on. This one's wedged and glued on, won't come off. But when it breaks, it breaks, I'll just change the head. So what I'm going to do with this, there's a little bitty blade right there. You see this? And I'm going to reference the flat side of this onto this piece of wood. And I'm going to lower this blade down to where my, you know that mark that we put on with this? Right? The little laser mark? I'm going to go right just barely, barely above that. Yeah. Can y'all see that better? And notice I'm come pulling this to toward me. If I was going to go push it away from me, the grain would split out and break on the other side. We don't want that. So I'm going to get this. I'm going to rotate this in my hand. And I'm going to pare this down, this wood with this plane. You see it starts moving on me a little bit? Well, that's the magic of the dog holes. So I'll just grab me a dog, wherever my dogs are. Here, there's a dog right here. So when I'm coming toward me, it's moving, so I put a dog in that hole. And then now when I'm coming towards me, it's not going to move anymore, right? So I'm just going to pare this down. This will get, this will make it just about pretty perfect. Now before I get to the other side, I turn my tool around and I attack from the other direction. So it appears to be like this side is not as deep. Change it. Now this this wasn't centered, right? When we when we made this when we made this joint, it wasn't centered. It was just a tiny bit off. So that means this joint is it's on one side of the board or the other. That means the depth of this is going to have to change one way or the other because this is exactly, exactly in the middle. I can make it in the middle if I keep this tool the same because I'm referencing off it's going to be in the middle. We'll see what happens. So I'm, I'm cutting and it's way, way, way too deep. So it's, this tenon is higher on this side. Yep, a lot higher. So I'm going to change my tool. I'm going to bring my blade up a little bit and we'll clean it up and we'll be done. So I just reference off the Again, the side, turn it around. We'll take it out. If you really wanted to get super precise with it, you pull out what's called a shoulder plane. And the shoulder plane is a tiny little bitty uh, plane. It's so small, I've lost it in my mess down here. This. So this plane, remember the parts of it, this is the shoulder, this is the cheek. This is a shoulder plane that planes the shoulder of a tendon. That's, that's its job. That's why it was created. So I'm going to come here, and if there's any um, surfaces that are a little bit, um, I was going to try to do it that way so that you guys can see, but I can't get to it. If there's any surfaces in this that are just a little bit off, not exactly straight. I'm going to put this thing sideways. I'm referencing this side to my cheek, and I'm going to pull it across, and I'm cutting any of those weird spots out of there. This blade on both sides sticks out wider than the body, so it cuts into the corner underneath the, the shoulder. 
And look how messed up this is. You see how that is, right? So that's what this tool is for. If I were to put this in a tenon, I mean a mortise, it wouldn't sit flush. It, it would be, it wouldn't be tight. It would look really bad. It, it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. So you can clean all this up in no time with, with this little tool. You just gotta be a little bit patient with it. And notice I flip my tool and come back because if I go that way, I'm gonna break the grain. There we go. Now that's a thousand times better. Okay, that's a hand cut. That's a hand cut. Uh, now, this should be, these should be flat, right? So when I put this in the, the mortise, it should, it should be, should be perfect. So that's how, that's how this one was done. And then I just did the jawbone dowels on, on it. So there you go. Is there any questions? <laughs> I know it's kind of lengthy. So anybody got anything?